Uh, this week we're going to take a look at flats and flat construction, uh, or at least construction represented in flats. So you should be somewhat familiar with flats from FD11, um, but I want to briefly sort of just go over what they are. So flats are technical construction drawings that show all of the necessary seams, closures, darts, um, all the sort of aspects of a garment that would be needed for construction. And they are used as a sort of communication link uh, between the design room and the factory. So they are part of the insurance that when we send our designs overseas or to whatever factory we're having uh, make our garments, that the garments will be made correctly. Uh, and this is very important. So all necessary construction should be implicated on your flat sketch or else, unfortunately, uh, your garment might not be made accurately. Uh, so flat sketching is not very hard um, and in this course I'm going to be requiring you to do all your flats in Illustrator. Um, if there is some issue and you would like to communicate that with me, just send me an email and uh, we can potentially allow you to do flats by hand. However, I strongly encourage you guys to do it in Illustrator. Um, that is the industry standard right now. There are probably a few companies left still doing uh, flats by hand, but most of them are doing them in Illustrator. Uh, flats are very important to know how to do accurately and well uh, because it is one of the number one tasks for an entry-level designer to be able to do your um, fashion sketches or flat sketches. Um, they're also very important too because um, you know, we can all do lovely design sketches, but the sketches aren't really what's getting made. The flats are what's getting made. Um, so if you are going to be looking for a job or for making your own work, uh, you're going to have to make those flat sketches um, either for whatever company you're working for or um, to communicate your designs with a production company. So um, what I'm going to do is uh, you should have been emailed information on how to establish a remote link to some of the computers in, on campus, which will allow you access to all Adobe products, not just Illustrator. So you should be able to get Photoshop uh, as well, which is very helpful for when you're going to be doing your mood boards, um, fabric boards, things like that, or if you want to just sort of digitally enhance uh, your presentation sketches for your collection projects um, and we'll get to that you know a little bit further down the line um, but again um, double check to see um, uh, the information on how to create the remote link uh, between your computer and the campus computers which will allow you Adobe access uh, should have been emailed to you and also the link on how to download the appropriate software and what to do to create that link will be posted on Blackboard. So check it out, um, link up, and get your access. Um, as again, all flat projects for this class will be required to be done in Illustrator. Um, please email me uh, your flats in JPEG, um, not in AI, as the AI files are very large. Um, I'm also going to do a little bonus video this week, so check it out. Uh, just a little review on how to use um, Adobe Illustrator to create your flats. It's not going to be very long as there are a lot of sources out there uh, to teach you how to use um, Illustrator and especially even to do flats in Illustrator. Um, but I'm going to do a quick review um, and if it's not quite enough, if uh, you should be fairly familiar because you should have already taken FD13 or um, are already in FD13, uh, but if you'd like to review a little bit more, there are plenty of resources on YouTube and the internet to teach you how to use Illustrator. So I'm just going to do a quick short video on a review of basically the necessary techniques on uh, in Illustrator on how to use flats. Now the drawing is not too difficult, but what can be a little bit confusing and overwhelming at first is learning all of the necessary construction that we need to put in our flats. Um, and of course, since they are technical drawings, uh, we need to have technically accurate flats, which means we need all the appropriate seams, uh, closures, uh, all the things I said before uh, accurately represented in our flat. So how do we know what needs to go uh, where and when? Well, we're going to take a look at that this week and we're going to look at some standard sort of garment constructions um, and sort of help to demystify um, your construction in flats. Now there's a companion handout to these videos 
uh, which is in the course content uh, under handouts. Look for it. It's flats. It will sort of summarize everything that we're going to go over this week, uh, give you examples, um, things like that. So it's very helpful. So take a look at that. Um, and especially you can utilize that when you are uh, creating your flats just to double check that you are placing your seams and, and um, closures and everything like that in the correct places and you have everything you need to make your flats into a technically accurate um, construction. So we're going to start today uh, looking at some shirts and some jackets. So one of the things with flats um, that makes it a little bit difficult is there are so many different ways to construct clothing. Um, however, there are a lot of sort of standard constructions, so um, very uh, commonly ways uh, uh, that garments are created. So we're going to look at them and we're going to look at where we can bury them and where we uh, should not bury them. So again, we're going to take a look at shirts and for the most part, all of these um, talks and uh, demonstrations are going to be for woven garments. Uh, we're going to do a little part on knits, but we're not going to get to knits until the last video, so part three. So for this video and subsequent videos, so all these shirts, all these jackets, let's assume that they are all woven. Now, you should know the difference between knit and woven, but let me just uh, make sure that you do. So woven fabrics, are made out of woven yarns. So we have many yarns, many different yarns that are placed. We have our length grain, like so. And then we have a cross grain. And if we're doing it in plain weave, um, we'll have the cross grains go over in an interlocking pattern of over, under, over, under, over, under, and then they get staggered. Now there's many different types of wovens, such as twills and um, basket weaves and, and different things like this. So this is just our basic plain weave, our over under construction. Um, however, this gives the fabric some unique properties. So with wovens, they do not tend to stretch. unless some spandex has been um, put into the fibers of the yarn. But even so, it only tends to have them stretch a little bit, not as much as knits. Um, and this non-stretch property um, makes the construction for wovens different than knits, okay? Um, so these yarns don't stretch, and again, um, if they do a little bit, um, it's mostly because there is some spandex put in it, um, but even woven garments with a little bit of spandex are constructed um, more conventionally toward normal wovens that don't stretch. The spandex is just there to make the garments a little bit more comfortable uh, for the wearer. Now when we get to knits, knits are constructed a little bit differently. Instead of having these different setup yarns that are interlocked together, knits are created from one continuous yarn. Now this might be a couple different yarns if there's different colors, but they're basically looped together. So you take loops and then another row will interlock the loops and they will continue sort of looping, looping, looping. And um, you'll get uh, two different sort of patterns. So for the knit, um, you'll get the knit stitch pattern, which if you look really closely to your knits, will kind of have a V-shape pattern on the front. And on the back, we'll typically have a sort of U-shape, interlocking kind of U-shape. Now these are the knit stitches and these are the purl stitches. And sometimes they alternate to create ribs, like my sh sweater I'm wearing right now. This is a knit, and those ribs are created by alternating um, the knit stitch and the purl stitch on the face of the fabric. And that creates these lovely little ribs, which we will talk about more in our knit section and how they play into design and also construction. Um, but the important thing to remember is knits always stretch. 
always stretch. They, and that stretch is not because there's spandex in it, and it's not because the yarn is inherently stretchy. It's because of the construction. So that yarn is looped together. So you have these little loops, and every loop has a little bit of give to it. So that little bit of give is what creates the stretch um, in our knit fabrics. Now this is 100% cotton. There's no elastic in it. There's no um, spandex in it. Uh, so the yarns themselves, if I were to take the yarn out and pull it out, it's not stretchy. This does this, it stretches out, because of the nature of how it's created, those little loops um, giving a little bit every time you stretch. Okay, and this makes the construction of knits very different from woven uh, because it stretches. And the main difference is um, when we put it on, we don't have to think of closures as much because it stretches open to fit our body. And also the actual shape of the garment um, will just stretch out around our body with knits. But with wovens, since it doesn't stretch around it, any sort of shape or fit needs to be seamed in. Um, so we'll keep that in mind and move on to woven shirt construction. Now, there are a lot of different ways to create um, shirts. But I'm going to take a look at the sort of standard collared shirt, um, which is the vast majority of woven shirts that we see today. Um, there are a few exceptions, of course, um, but if you see a woven shirt out there today, it's typically a sort of button-down collared shirt. Um, most other shirts will be some type of knit. There are the exception of, you know, female blouses. Um, that can come in all shapes and sizes and varieties, and we'll talk about that just a little bit and how they can vary. But let's go ahead and take a look at a woven shirt. So I'm going to go ahead and um, let's put in, you know, a little croquis, and then we will build it out. So maybe we have, oh, this one's out of juice. aspects that I'm going to go over are mostly related to both uh, men and women with the exception of potentially some fitting seams or darts that we might put in. Um, and this is because uh, the colored shirt is really a traditionally a uh, menswear item, uh, but the construction elements um, are the same uh, or mostly the same between men and women. So if you're making a woven collared shirt um, or even just any sort of woven shirt, you can leave the collar off if you'd like. Um, it will be pretty much the same. So I'm going to start up here, and of course we're going to have a neckline. Let's maybe start with that. Now, um, for the most part, so we are adding a collar onto this, um, but if not, you know, that would be fine uh, to leave the collar off. But when you do add a collar, there will always be a neck seam. There are a few exceptions called a built-up collar, um, but they're quite rare, and they only really work with sort of shorter collars, collars that don't really come up that much. Your standard sort of shirt collar, uh, or ones that you see in sort of, you know, polos, the half collars, um, turtlenecks, anything like that, uh, they are always going to have a seam at the neckline there. Okay? Now, um, what we also do is, uh, for woven shirts, we typically have a button closure. Now, you can uh, uh, substitute this for a zipper if you like, um, but typically we'll see a complete closure, so a closure that opens the entire front. Some very old school female uh, woven blouses will have the button closure on the back. Um, it was popular you know, um, some decades ago, it's rather old fashioned. You don't typically see it today because you can imagine how difficult it would be to button up your back. Um, but I guess they had extra help dressing back in the day. So you don't typically see those today, but you might find it in like a thrift store or something if you're looking for vintage clothing. Um, uh, typically, again, it's not seen in stores today because of the difficulty in putting it on and off. 
but we'll see that button placket come down the front. Now, when we see the button placket come down the front, it, the buttons will fall on the center front. Now, this is a very common mistake that I see. Um, we're, that, if this is the center front, we're not going to put the buttons over here. We're not going to put them over here. We're not going to put the actual opening over here. We're going to put the buttons down the center front. I'm going to make them kind of large so you can see them. So here's the buttons on that shirt. And we're going to have it come all the way down to the bottom of the shirt. Just pretend I made them even. So they are on the center front, and so what happens is the closure gets off set to the side. Okay? So don't make the mistake, this is wrong over here. So if I had a shirt, and a lot of times what people will do is they will put the opening here and then put the buttons on the side like this. It's not wrong, it's just not the common way. Now you will oftentimes see um, it purposefully done to have sort of this asymmetric look, but just know um, if you're gonna do that, make sure that you're doing it on purpose and not by mistake. Now in addition to our button placket right here, we need to finish it off with some top stitching here. Now, top stitching can be some of the most confusing aspects on where to add in flats, uh, and of course we have to add it too. Uh, top stitching will um, do a lot of things. It will help finish some constructions. In this case, it's help, helping to finish and create our button placket. Um, it creates hems, um, and it can also be done and added just for design purposes. Um, but hopefully after these videos, you'll know a, a little bit better on where to put your top stitching. So we have our top stitching going down here, and we have our opening over here. Okay, great, we have our button placket. That's a very important thing. So um, that is gonna serve as our closure. And a closure is any sort of part or element of the garment construction that allows you to take it on and put it, uh, take it on and off easily. Um, and of course, we need this to go all the way through here. And we'll talk a little bit more about closures as we uh, move on. But this is good for the shirt. All the way down, so the whole thing opens up, so it's very easy. You open the whole thing up, put it on, button it back up. So that allows us to do that. Um, of course, if we were to take this out, um, the whole thing out, we would not be able to wear the shirt anymore for two reasons. One, if it's a very fitted shirt, um, the narrow part of the waist would not be able to fit over the shoulders and this narrow neck would not be able to open because of this button placket is also allowing the neckline to open. And so we would not be able to get it over the head because the head is quite a bit wider than the neck. Okay. So moving on, what else do we need? Well, let's go on to the sleeves. Typically shirts like this will have some sleeves. And what I want to do, and this is another very often forgot part of the shirt, is the armhole sleeve. I'm sorry, the um, armhole seam. Now, for the most parts, whether you're working with wovens or knits, every sleeve is going to be attached to the body of the shirt with a seam. So you're always going to have this seam right here. Um, if you're ever in doubt, put it in. There are a few exceptions. So let's take a look at some of those exceptions right now. So armhole seam exceptions. Now the reason that we need the seam in the armhole is to get this nice sort of fit right in here. It allows us to kind of keep the tube that is the sleeve very close to the arm. But in instances where we don't want that, we can eliminate the armhole seam. So um, when we have what's called a dolman sleeve, also heard it kind of called a kabuki sleeve, we'll have a different sort of silhouette. So what will happen is
let me get a little body in here as well so you can see how it's fitting to the to the body so here's the little head the small head uh -huh. again that's maybe a little bit bigger um so here's maybe the arm that's coming out and the sort of the body coming down here. It's a little messy. The normal sort of types of sleeves are going to come right up here. So anything that kind of comes and follows that body line, again, is going to need that sleeve. But with a dolman sleeve, we get a different silhouette. Extra ease in space is put down here in the armpit. So as you can see, it sort of comes and there's a lot of space and looseness and drape um, uh, right here underneath the arm. And it typically the dolman sleeve will sort of um, be very, very loose and baggy right here at the armpit area and usually kind of taper off a little bit um, to fit a little bit closer around the wrist. These do not need armhole sleeves seams. So I don't need to put one there. And that's because I dropped this down so much. Again, just to sort of compare, this would be sort of how your normal shirt would fit up here. And this is your dolman sleeve. Now, a relative of the dolman sleeve is uh, the kimono sleeve. And it too is a rather large and baggy sleeve. So um, let's take this out. and show you what that looks like. Your kimono sleeve is going to be very flat, very straight, both in the top and bottom seams, and it's very large. As you can see, it sort of is a, this block shape coming down. Now these do not need an armhole seam either. Um, as they, again, leave so much um, uh, ease and distance between the armpit of the human and sort of the um, con um, joining of the sleeve and the sort of body of the shirt. Now, these are the exceptions to the rule. They're very rare and specific types of sleeves. So if you're not specifically trying to do either a dolman or a um, uh, kimono sleeve, put in that armhole seam. It is needed. Okay, back to our shirt. So we have our seam, which is fantastic. Now let's get down to the cuff. Now, if the cuff is wide enough, we can just do a very simple um, ending to it just as long as we go ahead and put some top stitch here, that will be to finish the bottom. So any place where you would put a hem or a finish would typically need some top stitch. Um, this of course is not your usual construction for a collared shirt. Collared shirt will typically have a cuff in it. Now, one thing to note about this, now I said this is fine as long as the cuff is wide enough. So if I don't have anything else and this is wide enough, wide enough for what? Well, your hand. But you will notice that your wrist is quite a bit smaller than the rest of your hand. So if you have a very narrow sleeve that hugs the wrist very closely, you could have some very big problems trying to get your hand through the end of it as your hand is bigger than your wrist. So you have to allow for some sort of um, opening uh, to occur to allow your hand to get through. Now, if you didn't want to put a cuff here and you wanted something rather um, tight, a couple of things you can do. You can always add a vent in your sleeve and you can put that anywhere. It's usually actually placed a little bit more on the back, but so we could place a little vent like that. That would ensure the hand easily gets through. Um, if you want to maintain a really tight silhouette to the wrist, you can substitute this slit for 
either some buttons, like a little button placket, like so. You don't have to do three buttons. You could do one, two, whatever you like, more. Um, or you could do a little zipper. Now we're going to sort of revisit this in pants as well because the same thing is true there. So a little zipper would work as well. Let's put a little zipper in there. And if it's closed, the little pull would be right here. Okay. So any of those things would work to help you to um, get your hand through. And again, if you have a wide opening, wide enough for the hand, you don't need to worry about any of it. But let's take a look at the cuff itself, what we do see on most collared shirts. Well, the cuff will come down. Typically what happens is the shirt is a little puffier than the cuff. The cuff will come and hug the um, wrist very, very tightly. So we'll see it kind of puff a little bit. And uh, this means that fabric needs to be taken in whenever we get that kind of change in silhouette. So we'll typically see a couple little puffs, but again, they're usually on the back. And I'm gonna go and revisit that when we do the back of the shirt, because most of those details are there. Actually, let's do it now. I'll just do a back view right here. So this would be what it looks like in the front, in the back. We get the cuff, and we need a couple things for the cuff. So we need a cuff opening, so we need a line here, um, and most of the time, since we have that, we'll have some sort of closure. Most typically, we'll go ahead and see like a little button right here. Um, we can also uh, have a sort of French cuff with a cuff link, or um, you could have a hidden closure, so you could have maybe snaps on the inside. It's up to you. Um, and you, there's plenty of resources out there to look at all the different types of cuffs that are available in the world. Um, but you just need to know what is necessary for your cuff. So we need it to open. So this is little line is showing where the cuff overlaps. And if I unbutton, I can open it. But without this additional piece of construction, which is the sleeve vent, it will only open this small area, which doesn't really help us in getting the, uh, the uh, hand through. So again, without this additional vent placket, again, it only will open up to here. And that again is too small for our hand to fit through. So the sleeve vent will allow us to open the cuff all the way up to here, um, getting this extra width um, in and allows us to put our hand through really easily. Now we can finish the sleeve vent um, a lot of different ways. Most men's dress shirts will come with a uh, what's called a sleeve vent placket which is a little piece, additional piece, that will look something like that. Um, it may have buttons on it as well, it might not. So maybe a couple buttons like this. Um, and remember how I was talking about how we get this sort of puff shape? Whenever we have more material going into a smaller area, we need to reduce the fabric somehow. And in this instance, we typically have a couple um, little tucks so we'll tuck the fabric together so it goes from this larger area into a smaller area by folding those little tucks together. Okay, so this is what you would need to uh, produce a uh, proper cuff um, that would easily allow um, hands to go in and out of it. Um, again, there's lots of different ways to be able to create this. Uh, do a little bit of research on your own, see what's out there, see what you like, um, and again, Whenever we go over all these sort of little details and little garment construction aspects of whatever we're talking about, um, I know it can seem a little overwhelming, but all these little tiny details, um, just look at them as opportunities uh, to add design in here. So there's lots of little things I can do with a sleeve vent packet, placket. Heck, you may never even have thought about sleeve vent plackets before in your life, but I can add a lot of stuff. I can do a contrasting color or fabric. I can make it a, an interesting shape. Um, lots of little things that I can tweak to it to sort of enhance my design um, and make it better, uh, make it a little bit more unique in um, you know whatever way that I would like it to. Um, and so again, uh, any designer that really knows construction well is a better designer because it, they have more opportunities 
to change things around and add little details and things like that. So the better you know your construction, the better and more competent a designer you will be. Not just because you're gonna be actually making clothes that people can wear, um, but that you'll have a better um, sort of vocabulary and knowledge on um, you know, where things can go, what can be changed, and how they can be changed to suit your needs. So here's our little cuff. Okay, great, looking good. Let's move on. Um, so we've talked a lot about this being colored shirt, so let's put a collar on her. Now, we have a lot of different types of collars. Um, one piece, two piece, coll Mandarin collars, things like that. Um, so let's go into how to draw the collar, a, t a basic collar, and I'm going to get the opportunity to show you sort of two different types of collar because um, every two-piece collar on a collared shirt will start with the collar stand, which if left by itself is um, perfectly fine. We would call it a Mandarin collar. Sometimes it's called, you know, the Mao collar. And we basically just put a rectangle that wraps around the neck. Um, and it will typically have a button right here to close it like that. So if you like that look, and I'm sure you've seen it before, um, you can leave your collar right like that. That's perfectly fine. However, if you'd like to move forward and finish off the two-piece collar, what we're going to do is attach another piece, and that's why it gets the two-piece collar name, because this is the first piece, and then we're going to put the second piece on. And it attaches to this top line right here. So what I can do is from here, and I'm going to start at that center front line and kind of just bring a V shape down. And again, you can play around with this because collars are purely designed. Um, they have, don't really add anything to the constructional or functional elements of this shirt. They're there to look a certain way. So colors are really fun to play around with and you can really have a lot of leeway with how you do it. Just be careful not to make them too tall um, uh, or else they start to bump into the chin. If you do that, you kind of need to flare out then you can kind of get that, you know, like weird cone of shame collar that I've seen on some sort of avant-garde designs, but um, they're not that practical. So we have this little V shape here. Let's continue it. From here, I'm going to take this line and carry it out to the uh, shoulder. And I'm going to create another line down from right here to meet up with it. Now all this is no longer visible, so we're going to go ahead and take it away. And there we have our collar. Um, it's a little big and a little wide, um, but I just wanted you to sh sort of see what's happening. Let's go ahead and put the other side of this on now, too. So that is our typical two-piece collar. Um, in addition, most collars will have some top stitching. This is sort of up to you. It depends on really the look that you're going for. Um, the top stitching on the collars are put in place to help keep it shape um, and make it really sharp and a little bit stiffer. If you'd like a little softer shape and a little softer feel to your collar, you might want to keep those uh, top stitching out. Um, it's really up to you and what you want to go for. In addition, I, I forgot, but um, same thing will happen on our um, little cuffs. For the most part, we're going to have top stitching on the top and bottom of our cuffs, again, to help kind of keep its stiffness, keep its shape, and also helps in finishing. So there we are. Okay, so let's move on. We're getting a pretty good shirt here. Let me do just quickly over here something to that we do have another side to the shirt. Okay. So I have not fit this garment very close to her body, but let's assume I do want it. Now if I keep it just like this, I wouldn't need anything because there is no shape to it. 
So you see the inside of the body here, your, that's where your croaky would be if you're drawing this. Um, I'm keeping it pretty much just straight down. And most men's shirts are going to have this silhouette, the sort of straight down, um, because of course men are much straighter down. Um, and so men's shirts do not need any of the fitting um, or darts uh, or seams that we would need um, in female shirts if we were going to fit it. I'm going to keep it like this for right now. Um, I think the last thing I'll do, I'll just show you, because we haven't really gotten into the sort of principles behind um, where we put our darts in our seams uh, to get what kind of fit. But what I am going to do is um, I'm going to do a little something on the hem here. So most of these shirts will come down to the high hip, even sometimes the hip. So what we do in men and women's shirts is we have to add a little couple things down to the hem in order to give us a little ease and a little bit of room around the hips. So um, in a lot of constructions, what they'll do is they'll shape the hem kind of like this. They'll have it a little higher on the hip, and then it will kind of come down. Now what this does is it allows for the hips to kind of come out, and um, so the shirt will not bunch up, and it just makes it a little bit more comfortable to wear, to move in, so on and so forth. Now, not all shirts have this shape, and there are other options for this. Now, this is perfectly fine, but you can also, if you don't want to shape it like that, if you want to keep a straight hem, say something like this, is you can vent it. So same thing um, as we have with the sort of vent, we can add a little vent here along the hips to create, um, uh, again, that ease that is needed around your hips. Now we're also going to put in, whether you shape it or not, some top stitching to finish the hem. Now I'm putting in one You'll typically actually see two. So let me, let me go ahead and put two in. And this, of course, is to finish your hem. So again, anytime you have a finishing, a hem, or the end of a sleeve, or even a neckline that isn't finished by a collar, you're going to have to go ahead and put in top stitching there um, to show how it's finished. There are some exceptions for that, um, but I'm going to talk more about those exceptions when we get to skirts and dresses, because you'll more likely see those exceptions on those types of garments. Okay. Now the only thing we're really missing uh, that is typical on the collared shirt for the front is a lot of times we'll see a pocket. So let's put in a pocket, and again, these are what are called patch pockets, and because it is a separate piece of fabric that is cut out and just sort of patched right on top of the garment. That means it can go anywhere you like because it's just a separate piece of fabric that's put on. But it also means that you need, need, need top stitching on the inside because that piece of fabric needs to be placed on your um, garment somehow. So we need that top stitching down these sides to indicate how it's sewn to the garment so all your things don't fall out and things like that. And I added a little up here just because this edge needs to be finished. This isn't going all the way through, this is just finishing the top, which we'll typically see. Um, so there's all of your different aspects of the front. Let's move on to the back. Actually, let me do um, one thing first before I erase this for the back and talk about um, yokes. Um, and this is sort of the perfect uh, transition from front to back because uh, on most shirts we'll see it come, start in the front, and then go around to the back. And this is very common for collared shirts, and uh, it really harkens back to the fact that these are really for men. So um, if you think about where men need to be fit around, where they're largest, um, it's really their shoulders. They have quite big shoulders. So yokes are in addition to a shirt and they help to fit around the big shoulders and create a little bit more ease in the shoulder blade region, um, which can move around a lot and needs that extra sort of fitting and a little extra ease, especially in men, again, because their shoulders are so big. Um, and it allows us to do that. But again, we can do a lot of fun things with yokes. 
So yolks, as their name suggests, because it's sort of like the same thing if you put it on the oxen, um, is a piece of fabric that starts on the shoulder and goes all the way to the back. So um, what I'm going to do is our yoke seams will go from the neckline to the armhole seam. And a standard sort of dress shirt will just be a very plain line like this. But again, so long as it's kind of going from the upper portion of your armhole seam to the neckline, to sort of the side part of the neckline, uh, you can really do anything with it. So a lot of kind of Western shirts, those kind of, you know, cowboy shirts, they'll go ahead and they have those fancy yokes and they'll kind of go and they'll point it down like that. I'm sure you've probably sort of seen something like that. Um, but again, it's up to you. If you want your yoke to be wiggly, you can have a wiggly yoke. It's all up to you. And again, you know, um, so long as it's again going from basically your upper armhole area on the front to the front neck, you're good. You can do anything you want to that seam. So have fun. Um, be creative. So like I said, it starts here, goes over the shoulder, and then we'll get another seam in back. And this will eliminate the shoulder seam. Now, um, cheaper shirts and uh, sort of cheaper collared shirts for women a lot of times will not have the yoke. It reduces the amount of seams and fabrics that you uh, need because uh, usually your yoke is a doubled up fabric. Um, so for cheaper, especially female, sometimes male, if it's very cheap, you won't see the yoke. But on you know your more expensive and better quality shirts, you will always see that yoke. So let's pop onto the back and see what uh, is in store for us there. Well, sleeves are going to be the same. So of course the collar goes all the way around to the back and basically I'm going to keep that same outline and just wrap it around for the back view. Of course, we have armhole seams in the back as well. And now that we're in the back view, we of course have those lovely little sleeve vent packets. That we have before. Uh, one note on the sleeve vent packet, you know, I, I try not to get too into detail about every single little way uh, you can construct everything, but there really is just so many ways. If you don't want that placket, if you want something maybe a little bit daintier, a little bit more elegant, um, it's very common for, for female shirts um, to just sort of have a loop in here, and then it's finished with a little bit of like bias tape or something. So it'll look a little bit something like that. And this, this is hollow, so you'd see the, the arm straight through there. Of course, you'd still have, you know, whatever little uh, tops to create that blousy effect. Uh, right in there, but this you can do this as well uh, if you wanted to not have looking for something maybe a little bit more feminine um, uh, in nature Okay, so on the back um, our typical yoke seam on your sort of standard dress shirt is going to go from sort of the bottom uh, sort of middle to bottom part of the uh, armhole seam and just go straight across now it's placed here um, to try to target the shoulder blades. So our shoulder blades are basically kind of in this area. Oh right, that one doesn't have any. Are basically kind of in this area um, and we want that seam to go through it. Because remember it's there to create fit um, and ease around those shoulder blade areas. Let's get this more of a back head look. Um, so again, we want it to pass through those general areas, but you can, same thing as the front, you can do whatever you want to it, so long as it's going, passing through these areas, going from one armhole seam to the other, and passing through the um, uh, shoulder blade areas. For example, I showed you the sort of Western style yoke seam on the front. Let's look at it in the back. So this would be that same sort of fancy schmancy um, western seam on the back and again this is very very common um, but again you can do anything you want if you want to go ahead and make a seam that is looking like this 
for your yolk, that's also fine. I wouldn't want to sew it, but it's fine. Um, so again, you know, uh, know the rules and then work within them. Um, and you'll see that you have a lot of freedom to um, express uh, different sort of design ideas and, and play around with these constructions. So again, you know, it's a lot to remember, but at the end of the day, um, it's all just opportunities for you to add a little bit more uh, to your designs and a little bit more depth, a little bit more creativity. So I'm going to just, I'm going to do the standard because again, I want to focus basically on the standard. And the other thing that we have in tandem with the yoke seam is a pleat. Now on standard shirts, they have, or standard modern shirts, they will have a box pleat right here at the center back, okay? Um, now this is creating that extra ease for our shoulder blades, um, and it can, makes moving around a little bit easier. Um, likewise, a lot of times for females, you'll see this taken out, um, uh, especially on cheaper shirts, because again, it's an extra detail, a little bit of extra fabric, so they try to cut corners. Um, but on most all male shirts, the male shoulders will need that extra ease, so it is there. On older shirts, older style shirts, you'll see the tucks not in the center back, but just one tuck placed closer to the shoulder blade. Now, in my opinion, this is better because you're putting the fullness exactly where you need it. You don't need the fullness right here. Your shoulder blades aren't here. They're here on the side. Um, so why is the modern version in the center and the older sort of, if you take a dress shirt from say the 50s, do they have it here? Well, it's sort of declining quality. It is faster and easier to make one pleat, especially one um, box pleat, which are particularly easy to make, especially because you just fold the fabric and make a stitch, than it is here. It's a whole extra step to put one here and then to put one here. Also, you have to measure because it's a specific distance. It's not just in the middle where you can just fold the fabric stitch. Here I have to measure in, fold it, stitch, do the same on the other side. So it's a little bit longer. And again, it has to do with sort of streamlining um, technique to make the uh, process and sewing process as fast and cheap as possible. So um, it also could be aesthetic. Um, maybe the center back is, was deemed more aesthetically pleasing. But um, in my opinion, it was simply to streamline the process uh, and make it a little bit cheaper to do. Uh, wherever you want to put your tucks put in, if you, even if you want to shirt it. So a lot of times, I'll show you another sort of alternative for the back, uh, which is um, particularly feminine. We'll have shirring. So we'll have an area of shirring, which will create a very sort of blousy back. So if it's very sort of full and flowing, kind of like this. Um, we'll have that shirring all along the, the uh, yoke seam right there. Um, and again, you'll see that, um, you know, in female blouses, female flowy blouses, but you will not see that in men's shirts, typically. Again, there's always exceptions to the rules, especially when it comes to what you're gonna, what you're gonna make for a male or a female, especially, if, um, you know, they're changing all the time, being challenged and whatnot. So I'm gonna put it here and then I do the modern standard with the um, center back top right there. And boop, 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 boop. of course, we need the top stitching on the uh, back as well. And that pretty much wraps up um, our standard shirt. The only thing I didn't really go over is uh, darting for the shirt. But I'm going to go over darting and seams for fit when we do dresses. And just know that if you are making a fitted shirt, that all those rules apply uh, to your woven shirts like this. Um, so. Moving on. Let's take a look at jackets. Now I want to kind. I'm going to cover maybe a couple different types, but I'm really going to focus on our sort of dress jacket, your sort of blazer, um, which that construction really kind of 
expands out to a, a, a wide variety of different types of jackets, like pea coats or uh, things like that. Um, you know, when there's so many different types of jackets, excuse me. Um, but there, a lot of them are based on this, and then, you know, specific ones, bomber jackets, or those bubbled coats, or things like that. You can always go online and take a look at how they're constructed. In fact, whenever you're making anything and you're unsure about the construction, I really recommend that you go online and look at garments that are similar. Um, because for the most part, we're not creating something so completely entirely new that there's no sort of reference garment for us. Um, a lot of you know stores and things like that, they have really great magnification. You can go in and look up really, really close on the images, see where those seams are, see what it's made out of, uh, so on and so forth. And you can sort of base um, or be guided by the construction of those garments. Okay, jackets. I pulled the one that doesn't have juice. So um, let's take a look at sort of our dress jacket. So our dress jacket, I'm going to start with the neckline, and it typically always kind of. Actually, I'm going to I'm going to put the croquis up here too. Yeah, I think it's a good reference. Just sort of see how it's going to fit on the body. Top of the head's getting cut off, but it doesn't matter. So let's say we have a little bit of a body right here. And I'm going to make it um, fairly androgynously shaped. Because again, um, just like before, uh, you know, we have uh, male and female versions of this. And we're going to have the arms coming out here, but blah, blah, blah. So what I want to do first is I want to put in the neckline. And when we're talking about sort of blazers or dress jackets or things like that, I don't know why, I think the neck was too big, but I guess it's, it doesn't matter. We are going to have a sort of pointed shape. So I'm going to bring it from around the neck down and I'm going to kind of create this V shape um, around the neck. Uh, coming down and of course you can make it as deep as you want oh, there's a lot of sort of modern female dress jackets that are pretty risque they uh, dip down quite a bit um, it's up to you from here we the same rule applies with our button placement along the center front and this is for your standard jacket I'll discuss double breasted in a minute So you can put as many buttons as you want on your jacket, especially for females. Uh, men, uh, typically your, their suits are going to be between two and four. Some are even just one button if it's a little bit more casual, kind of a drapey feel. Um, there's, <laughs> people have a lot of opinions on how many buttons a man's jacket, a man's jacket should have. Uh, and if you want to look at some you know, internet style forms for men, you can read up on it all. But you, as a designer, have license to make jackets with as many buttons as you please. However, for this type of jacket, the first button should be placed fairly closely to the end of this point, or else it doesn't really close nicely and you won't get that sort of uh, nice shape. So we'll go ahead and place one button here. Continue to go on. And I'm gonna have this jacket fully closed um, oh, that's an important thing too. So whenever you're having a shirt with a button pocket or a jacket with a closing, always draw your flat with the garment closed. So the button's buttoned up, the zipper's zippered up, um, um, unless you want to do an additional drawing to show sort of something on the inside. Uh, always draw your jackets. Don't have them sort of opened up uh, to show both sides. Always do them closed. Um, now, there's also um, a lot of opinions on whether the last button on a man's jacket should be buttoned when worn, but I'm not going to get into that today. Uh, so here we are, have our buttons. Again, they're on the center front. We have not placed them um, to the side. And we're going to go ahead and continue this line down to sort of go to the side of our buttons. 
Um, now we do not need the same sort of dotting on the front with the button placket as we do with the shirt. That's because the buttons on jackets are typically created with a facing um, uh, and not sort of folding over the fabric like they are on shirts. So it's a different construction. So you do not need your top stitching here for your jacket. Okay. Um, again, I'll circle back to do uh, double-breasted and asymmetrical um, jackets, what you might think of, but let's do the lapels. Now, the lapels on a jacket are usually sort of two parts. Um, one part here and then a collar back here. Now, again, just like with the collar, lapels serve no function uh, other than aesthetic. So you can do whatever you want with your uh, lapels. And certainly over the ages, lapels have done many things. Uh, in the 70s, they got really big. Um, in the 90s, they got really narrow. Um, but again, your lapel uh, depends on your customer and what they're looking for and you as a designer. So if you want to experiment with your lapels, if you want to make them a little crazier, go for it. There's really no shape that is wrong um, because again, they don't serve any function. So have fun. I'm going to do a standard one. A standard one is kind of a triangular wedge shape. And what they will do is the, um, the lapel is actually formed. If I were to flip it back this way by this piece of fabric here, it's sort of a continuation of this piece of fabric that gets folded out like so. So it's actually part of this front piece right here. It's finished again with that uh, a facing, which will continue on with your button packet, that same facing that is used to create, finish your, uh, the edge right here, and your button packet is also used to finish your facing. So um, you can have it be the same material, or you can have it look um, different. So even though it is this same piece of fabric that gets folded over, if you finish the facing with a contrasting piece of fabric, you of course can have a contrasting uh, lapel. So again, we have this sort of uh, wedge shape right here, and if you want to round it or jag it or whatever you want to do, go for it. Make it bigger, make it smaller, and I'm just going to put one on the other side as well. Ooh. Okay, now to complete our jacket, um, what happens is we have a collar, a one-piece, sometimes two-piece, uh, folded collar around here and so it will kind of create this little knot shape here when attached to the lapel and it goes up and it sort of rolls around the neck like so and what happens is though it's flat here it kind of curls and folds over in the back um, Actually, hold on, I'm going to uh, show you an example of this. Hold on just a second. probably brought these in before, um, but just a couple examples on what we're doing. Uh, just to sort of backtrack a little bit, I have uh, brought a shirt in. So you can see, it's just typical men's shirt. Um, here's the collar stand right here. So that's what I was talking about that one before. Here's the other piece that is attached to it. And this is a standard men's shirt. Um, and it has a little bit of, okay, this is a, <laughs> it's a cheap one. <laughs> A little bit of that angle here so it's sort of dipping down a little bit we have the cuff here's that sleeve vent placket you can see it has um, one button and um, I just want to show you how that opens so shot it looks like this you can see this has a little bit of these notches in the in the collar that's for style like so, 
And so the it will finish tightly around the wrist here. And then when you open it, this allows the cuff to open up. So I gotta undo this little button too. All the way to the end of the sleeve vent placket. Come on, you little button. Oh, this guy's tough. So we have it open all the way there, and you can see how wide that opens up so our hand can easily fit through, no problem, no muss, no fuss. Um, <laughs> so this has a yoke, but it, it, it actually doesn't have any of the, um, the pleats that I was talking about. Um, and this is a mark of a cheap shirt, so it's my boyfriend, so sorry, he's not here, but <laughs> it is a cheap shirt. Um, and then of course we have our button placket, as I said, our buttons down the center front, and we have that um, uh, top stitching as well. You probably can't see it, but it's there. Um, so just to show you, and then of course the little tucks uh, right here that are blousing out the shirt sleeve and allowing that excess fabric to come into the sleeve cuff. Now here I have a jacket, which is not cheap because it's mine. And um, so it's a, it, what we're talking about. So I want to just focus on the lapel. So as you can see, the lapel um, is a part of the uh, the actual jacket. So um, I don't know if I, how easily I can see this. So see here, there is a dart that runs down here, that's for fit, that's not for attachment, that's just to make it fit a little bit better. Um, and that is especially found on uh, female jackets uh, to help sort of fit around the bust a little bit easier. You can see that, that dart that runs down there. But here you can see very easily that it ends and this part of the lapel is, is continuing uh, on with the rest of the jacket. Now you can see here is the um, facing on the inside. Here. So the lining starts here. This is what the facing. And we can do this a contrasting fabric. This jacket is not contrasting. So it, the, the lapels are the same fabric um, and same color as the other part. But it basically just flips out. That's what creates the lapel. But the collar, however, is a second piece. Now on this collar, it is the collar is just one piece. Um, this part in here is just to help sort of attach it. Um, but a lot of times we can exaggerate that how depending on how high we want the collar to be. So if you can see, this is sort of flat. But what happens when it goes on a person? is the collar will lay flat in the front. So the collar is going to uh, lay flat in the front. And of course, we can pop it up depending on your style, but typically it gets folded down in the back. And so it looks like this. So here's that seam, here's the notch, so on and so forth. And then we have our nice little buttons. There's three on this one. Um, so a little seam that connects the collar part to the lapel down here. Okay, let's go back to it. Now there are lots and lots and lots of different lapel shapes and um, ways to do this. And actually on that handout that I was talking about before, uh, your flat handout, uh, there's a lot of different examples on how to do your lapels and you know, uh, you can do your own research and you can come up with your own different types of lapels as well. Just make sure that um, if you are doing this sort of type of collar with a lapel uh, and the collar that you have this seam right in here. Okay, moving on. Uh, let's give it some sleeves. This, like every other option, has armhole sleeves. And because they're jackets, the armholes tend to be a little farther away from the center of the body, just to give it a little bit um, more ease, since jackets typically go over other 
garments. So, boop, boop, boop. Okay, let's go ahead and. Now, jackets will typically have a sort of rounded, especially dress jackets like this, will have a sort of rounded edge right here. Now, if you want to shape it as well, you can. Like so. Now, there is uh, not all jackets, but a lot of jackets will have a specific um, seaming that's a little bit different on the sleeves. So typically when we have a sleeve seam, we have one seam that goes kind of down uh, the, the middle and sort of goes flush with our side seam. However, on a lot of jackets, they'll have what's called a two-piece uh, sleeve. And if you want to sort of see what that looks like, your basic sleeve, which you should you know be fairly familiar with your sleeve, basic sleeve pattern, is going to look something like this. Okay, your two piece, as the name suggests, is no longer one piece. This piece up here will look, uh, it basically takes the middle piece and then these two side pieces and then connects them. So your two sleeve pieces on your two piece sleeve will look something like this. One for the over part and one for the under part. So this part goes here and this part goes here. So you will have that there. You don't have to have that on your jacket. It just is kind of common. So I may as well uh, mention it here um, when we're doing jackets. Um, a lot of times when you do have that two-piece sleeve, uh, so you'll see the seam run up here, and it will typically meet a sort of side seam or side panel seam, sorry, side panel seam in uh, the body of the garment. And we can get all of our fit out of that seam as well. So something that looks maybe something like that. Now typically on jacket two, we'll see some type of pocket. Um, either it'll be a sort of welt pocket, which sort of looks like that. Um, sometimes it'll have a little flap to it, kind of like, like that. Um, there's lots of different types of pockets. Um, and again, on that handout, I have, uh, I think, you know, almost half a page of different pocket styles you can have from patch pockets to welt pockets. So just take a look at that. Um, and again, if you don't want pockets on your jacket, you don't have to put them in, but um, it's certainly uh, nice to have them. Okay, let's talk a little bit about double breast. So, um, double-breasted jackets have two rows of buttons that are equally distanced from the center front. So, if this is our center front coming down here, what we'll do is we kind of decide where we want our um, buttons to be. And again, they will be uh, equally distanced. So, the same on both sides. You can also, you can, if you want to have them well, I'll talk about alternative ways to do this first. Let me just do the standard. And they'll just be kind of two rows of buttons that come down like so. Now, to adjust our opening, what I'm going to do is, now that button's a little high for this, but it's going to be pretty much the same, and we're going to kind of come down and go like this. Now, this is going to change a little bit of our lapel because our lapel is going to really kind of start here kind of go a little bit more like this. You can see. And so we'll sort of change what this looks like as well. And there's our double breasted. Easy peasy, no worries. Um, asymmetric, so uh, we don't need to necessarily, if you wanna do something a little different with your double breasting. They don't need to be completely straight lines. If you want to sort of taper the distance, make them kind of come together a little bit closer at the end, you can do that. Just make sure to adjust your opening. Like so. It's going to kind of come down like 
like that. Now, uh, there's also asymmetrical jackets, um, which are atypical, but let's but certainly possible. So um, I could also make a jacket with, let's say, uh, a diagonal run of buttons like this. You might seem to have seen something like this. And again, everything is pretty much going to stay the same. Just our opening is going to change to adjust to our um, button plat well, or button opening. All right, looking good. Let's go to the back. Oh, actually, I'm going to leave the sleeves. The sleeves are going to stay the same. But we're going to get rid of this. Now in the back, the collar again is sort of folded down and we're going to take that same shape from the front and just kind of create the collar like so. Now in the back of jackets, what you will often see, let's see if mine has it. No, mine doesn't have it. Uh, but for, especially for men's jackets, um, and you know, it, it's really for style. Uh, they'll have a little vent with some buttons on it. I'm sure you've seen that. Um, now jackets, this opening tends to be wide enough for your hands to fit through. Um, but if they weren't, this could certainly um, serve as an opening that would allow your jackets, uh, your hand to be able to put through. However, for the most part, when I see these sorts of little buttons on jackets today, they're mostly just for decoration, not for anything else. Now the back is going to be pretty simple. Now we may still have these side panels that come in because of course these seams are going to be on the front and the back because of the sleeve construction that I showed you. Now uh, jackets like this um, for the most part are going to have uh, a center back seam and that is because they will typically have a vent in them. And this is because most jackets come down um, at least to the high hip, sometimes even further. And to help fit over the butt, we kind of get a little bit of a vent right here. And we're just going to show that with a little bit of top stitching and a little bit of a break in the line like so. Um, and really there's not too much else going on in the back that I want to talk about. So um, I'm going to end part one of our jackets. Again, um, do check out the uh, flat handout. There might be a couple things that I missed and also there's lots of nice examples on it uh, of the different types of pockets, different types of lapels, different types of collars, so on and so forth. So check out the handout um, and I'll see you in part two. All right, bye-bye.